welcome to season two of my lathe project. You'll see now that the Boxford lathe has a new coat of paint and looks a little brighter. Not a perfect paint job, but uh, certainly looks a little better. But before I did that, I um, completed the current project and did an overhaul of the uh, head of the lathe and some other parts as well. But I couldn't find any information online about the components or exactly how it all works. So this could be useful information to anybody else wanting to do an overhaul of a Boxford lathe. And I'll dedicate some time to that later. Another aspect of the overhaul was a complete rewiring of the switch that operates the motor on the lathe. This uh, was originally designed to run in forwards motion only because as a high school lathe it could cause the chuck to fly off if you suddenly throw it into reverse but I have found it quite inconvenient not having a reverse so I worked out how to rewire it with a reverse gear so I'll talk about that in another episode later but first let's talk about the projects I've been working on you'll recall that I had my grandfather's hero steam engine that was designed by the Greeks 2000 years ago and got that refurbished and running but before that was completed I decided I'd rebuild it and make a new one and so this part of the project is about building this new version of the Heroes steam engine and uh, here we'll see a video of it running on compressed air. Here you see it running on steam sitting on the gas barbecue and building up a pressure of 12 pounds per square inch to get it started and it runs and this is the simplified version doesn't have any uh, fancy bearings, just uh, little pivots that were the same as the Greek design exactly actually. Um, I sometimes think that they must have tried ball bearing races and found they didn't work back in the Greek days. That was my experience, the, the ball bearings created too much friction. And uh, we've been through various different modifications of this design for various reasons and uh, the reason I'm explaining all this to you is because I think it's a good idea to show you the completed project before we go about showing you how we made the various parts of it. It will make a lot more sense I think if you can see where we're heading with the project. The object of this project actually is to demonstrate that the Hero Engine could do some work. It's been argued that it produces so little torque that it's a, only a toy. Well it's true that it has low torque but it can produce high RPM and the idea was to see if we could maximize the RPM and then gear it down. I calculated that it should produce at least 4 watts at a couple of thousand RPM and uh, so part of the project is to gear it down and I built this worm gear for that purpose and that's the first thing I'll demonstrate the uh, building and this is the final product. It's designed so it can be tilted over like this uh, with the idea that I might connect it to an Archimedes screw and demonstrate that it can pump water using Greek technology. Power output is calculated by multiplying RPM res per minute by torque. So this gearbox reduces the RPM by 44 and therefore increases the torque by a factor of 44. Well I was thinking it was going to be really complicated to make this little gear wheel but I found a really neat little trick which I'm going to show you next. I'm quite excited about it. produced great results and it's very easy to make this little wheel. I thought it would involve milling machines and indexing gear but this is how you do it. Here we have a tap. It's a 20 millimeter tap with a pitch of 1.5 millimeters mounted in the chuck turning around and just automatically cutting these grooves in a blank of bronze. So uh, it's an incredibly easy way of making a little uh, worm gear and in fact it could be modified by raising and lowering the blank while you're cutting it so that you can make a full width gear rather than just a worm gear. So uh, this is by far the easiest way to make a, uh, a gear wheel on the lathe. Just automatic practically. It takes a little bit of time to set up the system so that you've got the blank in the right position and so on and you do have to calculate that the circumference of the blank is correct. The circumference is calculated from pi times the diameter and this has to equal an integer number multiplied by the pitch. So the pitch in this case is 1.5 millimeters and in this case actually it's multiplied by 44 but you can replace it by a variable n. So n times 1.5 pitch divided by pi is the diameter you require for the blank. 
that are simply calculated from first principles from the circumference uh, being pi d and being equal to n times p. This shows the worm drive in action and I have a thread driving the gear wheel now and the thread is actually the same as the tap that I use. It's a 20 millimeter diameter thread with a pitch of 1.5 millimeters which perfectly matches the grooves made in the gear wheel. So now you can see exactly how it works. Now this was my first attempt at making the gear wheel and it was a failure and I felt I should show you this so that you'll know how not to do it. This is failing, as you can see, really just mashing up the thread. And it wasn't because the diameter was incorrect, but you'll soon see if you look closely what's actually happening. Here the gear wheel is dropping right into the grooves in the tap and jamming. So I realized that the correction for this is to make a thicker blank. The next stage would be to turn the thickness of the gear wheel down to the required thickness after it's, you've actually made the gear wheel. And here you can see the recess and we'll talk about how we did that. To get exactly the right thickness we have to take off a measured amount of each side and the next segment explains how to take a measured amount off using the lathe and the facing process. Now you can see I've got the gear wheel in the chuck but I'm using copper protector plates so that the chuck doesn't damage the gear wheel. The, the chuck is only slightly tightened so it doesn't fall out uh, while I get it centered and running some smoothly and aligned well and that's done by bringing the live center up to the surface of it while it's spinning. After clamping the work in the chuck we move the cross slide here uh, until its calibrated dial reads zero as a reference point and then we move the work using the main apron uh, drive to push the tool right up against the edge of the work and now that's set as a reference point we clamp the the uh, apron or carriage so that it can't move once we start using it and now the tool is set right on the surface we can use the compound slide to advance it a few thousand of an inch or whatever we want to cut off and then we can set it cutting here I'm using the power feed to drive the tool across using the gearbox here set at a D6 no T7 position which moves it 0.13 millimeters per turn of the chuck. So it's quite a slow feed and here it is automatically feeding through on the uh, cross slide. I get most of my scrap material from a scrap metal dealer and this piece is pretty irregular in shape so I'm turning it between centers uh, and I've taken the chuck off and replaced it with a center, a dead center, and a face plate which has a slot in it. The slot connects into the dog which is clamped onto the work and at the other end there's also a centre, a live centre in this case and the work is being cut with a power drive. Here you can see the live centre in action with the centre actually rotating in its ball bearing race. Here we are drilling a hole in the block of material ready for boring a hole in the centre for mounting the or bearing race and we're using the tailstock to drive the drill and locking the tailstock down, driving it in and we can use the calibration on the tailstock to determine how deep the hole has been drilled. The first drill I used was a uh, center drill actually which I didn't show you. Then a pilot hole drill has been used to make the small hole and now I'm opening it out to full 5 eighths of an inch which is the largest drill size that I actually have and this actually fits into the chuck. You can actually get more tapered drills which are bigger that go directly into the tailstock without using a chuck uh, but I don't have any of those. Now we're going to use the boring tool and uh, I'm using a quick change tool post mainly because of the good rigidity it provides but also it's quite quick and convenient to change the tools. I have a set of seven tool holders here from parting tools and left-handed cutting tools, right-handed cutting tools, an earling tool and a boring tool. You may notice the tips are silicon carbide replaceable inserts. They're diamond shaped and gold colored 
they're held in place by a small torx screw and uh, they're very sharp and hard but uh, you can chip them and then they can't be re-sharpened you just have to replace them I still like to use my old high-speed steel tools for special applications because they can be ground on a grinder to any shape you like whereas these tips are just simply diamond shape and that's it, you're stuck with it now we want to make a taper inside the board hole and to do this we alter the angle of the compound slide. To do this we have to loosen two allen keys on the sides of the compound slide and adjust the angle and then reclamp the allen keys. Now I've brought out the recess with a very slight taper on it and the opening of the recess is exactly the same size as the board bearing race and this will be force fit pushed into this recess and actually I found with two degrees I couldn't actually push it in without heating the block with uh, hot water and putting the um, ball bearing race in the freezer to cool it down and then it would fit in quite neatly and it cooled down and clamped onto it tightly. Now that I've finished turning it I'm cutting it off with a parting tool and actually I found this a little tricky because uh, the tool tends to move up and down and uh, cut uh, intermittently. Uh, I've been told that I need to adjust the height to the centre, but I've done that and tried raising it above and below centre. But I think the problem is I might have a bit of movement in the cross slide that's causing this difficulty, but it does actually cut off eventually. Here I'm setting up the work in a four jaw chuck and I want to make sure that the uh, hole that I drill on the side is going to be at right angles to the shaft and I'm doing that with a level. Uh, it looks like it's set up in the chuck okay. It's a bit tricky because I, curved, I um, turned a taper on the end of there so it doesn't uh, grip very well with the, with the four jaw chuck. So it's going to be mainly gripping on two jaws. The other ones are just uh, there to keep it in alignment. So now we're just checking it with the center to make sure it looks right and then we'll choose a center drill and mount it in the chuck to drill the center hole and then later open it out to the required size. Well this is the end of episode 1, season 2 and I call it season 2 because they are actually recorded in different seasons. I go to my vacation home where I use the lathe for one or two months each year and uh, there really are two seasons.